My first speaker, I'm pleased to, I've known for many years, Michael Posner, who's our Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor. That's a long title which says that the internet is profoundly important now as a, as a national security and foreign policy issue in terms of freedom globally. And working through that um, is Michael's job. Um, he was working on it at Human Rights First, where he was executive director prior to becoming um, uh, a member of Senator of, our, uh, of the uh, State Department. And he has done a tremendous job in helping to, to facilitate uh, Secretary Clinton and President Obama's vision of an open internet uh, around the world. And he's here to give us an update on where things are, because without, we have no system of global governance. Uh, we have free expression um, as a value and a human rights value, but there's no First Amendment um, outside the boundaries of the United States. How can we promote freedom and openness and an open internet without breaking it as it has in China? Um, that's the challenge of our State Department. And so it's a great pleasure to welcome Michael Posner to give us an update on where we are and tell us his vision of the, the coming years. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jerry. Um, thanks for inviting me. And, and actually, the, if the truth of the uh, matter be told, I invited myself here today because I care so much about these issues. But Jerry, who's, we've been long uh, collaborators. Uh, I want to thank you and Tim Lorden of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee uh, for graciously allowing me to come here and speak. I'm here to speak about internet freedom as a foundation for the 21st century human rights agenda. It's a pleasure to be joined by uh, Christine Varney, a lawyer's lawyer who is much missed uh, inside the Obama administration. Uh, and I see in the audience a large number of friends from Congress, from corporations, from NGOs uh, who have helped map out a smart and principled set of internet policies for our government. Uh, they've also helped shape policies for socially responsible companies to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms uh, online. Together, uh, our, we aim to preserve the promise of the internet as we know it. And as Jerry said, in the face of growing threats to the freedom and integrity of the global network. The past year has highlighted the, both the promise and the peril of the internet as a transformative tool both for human expression and for repression. So I would like to take a look back at the lessons learned from the digital earthquake of 2011 and offer a few thoughts on the ways forward. It was almost exactly a year ago on January 15th that Tunisian President Bin Ali boarded a plane in Tunis with his family and departed for Saudi Arabia. 27 days later, Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak resigned. Eight months later, Muammar Gaddafi was gone. And a month after that, Yemen's President Saleh announced his resignation. Time magazine named the protester as the person of the year for 2011. The Arab awakening has been like a geopolitical earthquake, sending aftershocks rumbling around the world. Repressive regimes trembled at the power of people connected and redoubled their attempts to crack down. They did it by jailing bloggers, hijacking Facebook pages, and in the case of Iran, requiring cyber cafes to install surveillance cameras. They managed to buy sophisticated technologies to sniff out digital dissidents and silence them. Meanwhile, some governments are trying to impose national and international restrictions that would cripple the exercise of human rights online. They are using terms like, quote, information security and internet management 
to try to justify repression. We must protect the free flow of information and also the integrity of the network. By that I mean the interoperability of the network in two senses of the word. In the technical sense, the ability of machines to talk to one another, and in the sense that countries must not isolate their citizens inside national intranets. Whether this is, you call this the halal internet or a hate-free internet, it's a digital bubble. It's, it's locking people inside a world of government-controlled content and cutting them off from the rest of the world. These trends are not news to most of you or to us either, but they are intensifying. It's been almost exactly two years since my boss, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, gave her first major speech on internet freedom at the museum. She made history by declaring two things that seem glaringly obvious now. First, that the universal human rights to freedom of expression, assembly, and association apply online as they do offline. And second, that promoting those rights online must be a US foreign policy priority. Since then, she has consistently warned that protecting human rights and intellectual property rights and the ability of law enforcement officials to stop online crime and cybersecurity and stability will be both challenging but essential. The Arab awakening has upped the stakes further, most of all for activists trying to change repressive regimes from within. People are using technology as a battering ram against the walls of fear and isolation that dictatorships erect to keep their populations quiescent. In country after country where governments have controlled nearly every aspect of life, people are demanding openness and accountability, as well as jobs and opportunity, using old ways and new ways to make themselves heard. They've done it online by risking life and limb on the streets. They've done it in song and text message and in videos smuggled across borders when the internet was turned off. It turns out that two billion network users are nearly impossible to silence. In my world, the world of human rights, the new capacity for instant communication and participation has created an unprecedented dynamic. Let me give you an example. Last week in Syria, Arab League human rights monitors complained unofficially that they were not being permitted to view protests or interview demonstrators or travel freely to observe events. Yet that same day, anyone with an internet connection could watch horrific footage on YouTube of wounded protesters in Syria who appeared to be dying on camera. Syria is not having a Facebook revolution or a Twitter revolt or a YouTube winter, Syria is having a mass outbreak of courage. Tens of thousands of demonstrators know they risk arrest, torture, and death if they take to the streets. But they're doing it anyway, day after day. Their courage does not emanate from any digital device. It comes from knowing that they are not alone. So yes, the internet is empowering, Yet we agree with Vincent Cerf, who wrote in an op-ed piece last month, that internet access is not in itself a human right. Freedom of expression, assembly, and association are human rights. Technology can enable those rights. Technology is not a substitute for political organizing or advocacy or persuasion. The internet does not bring people into the streets. Grievances do. The internet did not spark the Arab Spring. Injustice did. It's worth noting that the Arab Spring did not start because of Twitter. It started because of the heartbreaking decision by one vegetable vendor, Mohammed Bouazizi, to set himself ablaze. Connective technologies are powerful tools for strengthening and amplifying the bonds between people and organizations for good and for ill. Last year, they enabled terrorists to recruit, and they enabled global corporations to solve a myriad of human problems by
by transcending time zones, borders, and even language barriers. The same connective technologies that enable teenage bullies to orchestrate the per persecution of their victims also enabled Russian activists to monitor parliamentary elections and then to organize huge street demonstrations protesting the unfairness of those elections. But let me be clear about US policy. We don't promote internet freedom <clears throat> or connective technologies as a means of pr promoting regime change. We promote the freedom of expression, association, and assembly online and offline because these universal freedoms are the birthright of every individual. Human rights and human dignity are not bestowed upon people by groups or governments, and no government should feel empowered to deny them. It is up to every individual, and therefore the people of every country, to decide how to exercise them. Let me state for the record that international law applies to online behavior, full stop. We do not need to reinvent international human rights law or our enduring principles to account for the internet. No deed is more evil or more noble when it is committed online rather than offline. You can't sell pornography in Farragut Square or Tahrir Square, and you can't sell it on the internet either. You can't break into a theater and steal movie reels, and you can't steal movies online either. You can't beat up and gag a peaceful protester, and you can't jail her for a blog post criticizing a government policy either. Now, I said earlier that we agree that no one has a human right to any particular technology. But at the same time, we believe the creators and purveyors of technology have a responsibility to protect human rights through their products and their practices. Moreover, the responsibility of corporations to respect human rights extends far beyond the creators of a given technology. It is the responsibility of every company. Last year in a landmark move, the United Nations Human Rights Council recognized the corporate this corporate responsibility by endorsing John Ruggie's guiding principles on business and human rights. But of course, the challenge is always how to live out those principles in real time. Today, we're all living in a fishbowl, 24-7, live on webcam. Any one of us may face public scrutiny for the decisions we make. It's instant scrutiny. And most of us are still learning the new rules for life on webcam. That applies to politicians, God knows, officials like me, and CEOs. Companies are held to account by regulators and lawmakers, by the media, and by individual consumers who can now tarnish a global brand that took years to build with little more than a retweet. Last year, we saw media coverage and social media attention and scrutiny from lawmakers about cases in which tech companies were alleged to have helped repressive regimes crack down on their own people. Social networking companies pressured to hand over information uh, about political activists, cell phone signals used to locate dissidents, and especially evidence that the latest, greatest surveillance technologies have been sold to Syria and Iran and Muammar Gaddafi's Libya. The moral issues in those cases are fairly cut and dry, but for tech companies figuring out how to apply their principles to a messy and fast-changing world is much more complex, and it's getting even tougher. Still, other industries have faced similar issues and found a way forward. The smart companies have learned that the way to adapt to 24-7 scrutiny is to address the underlying issues before they find themselves in the crosshairs of controversy. Many have found it useful to collaborate with other companies, even their toughest competitors. Companies in the extractive industries, which pull resources out of the ground in some of the most conflict-wracked places on Earth, have faced up to this problem. 
They joined with governments and NGOs in a collaborative effort to minimize the risk of human rights abuses. Private security contractors have faced up to the problem. More than 200 of them have signed on to a new international code of conduct that addresses their use of force and bans torture, sexual exploitation, human trafficking, and forced labor. And apparel companies have faced the challenge of curb curbing sweatshop practices in their global supply chains. A number of them have joined together with NGOs and universities to allow scrutiny of their factories by independent auditors. So oil companies, garment makers, private security contractors are making money in hard places. Each has realized that one of the costs of doing business in those places is to assess the risks and to invest in developing principles, people, and processes to address the human rights challenges they face. Technology companies must now do the same. And since nearly every tech company depends on the internet, internet to operate, all have a special stake in protecting the freedom and integrity of the net, as well as the human rights of their customers. Their young customers may turn out to be the Nelson Mandela's and the Václav Havel, Havel's and the Bill Gates's or the Steve Jobs of their generation. Companies have a growing reputational interest in developing practical and credible ways of working together and work with other key stakeholders to address these challenges. That doesn't mean that governments won't consider sanctions or other means to prevent transfers of sensitive technologies to regimes that use them to violate human rights. Sanctions can be a valuable tool. The Commerce Department is investigating how technology made by a California company called Blue Code Systems was diverted to Syria. The U.S. government is also committed to vigorous investigation of other allegations of dodging sanctions, whether directly or through middlemen. At the same time, we will continue with international partners to look at ways to make our sanctions smarter. But sanctions are not a perfect solution. No regulatory regime can substitute for thoughtful, proactive practices by corporations that must be mindful of the ways their products are likely to be used or abused in the real world. As Secretary Clinton said in The Hague last month, some companies come to the State Department and they say, just tell us what to do and we'll do it. But that's not a durable solution. Companies are best positioned to ask themselves the hard questions and their answers will evolve. They must make their own decisions about how and where to do business in parts of the world where laws are opaque, resale channels are murky, and human rights are often abused. And they must realize that their decisions can affect real people in real time. We stand ready to help. We see companies tackling these issues best when they work together. And so we salute companies like Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft, who have joined with NGOs, social investors, academic institutions to form the Global Network Initiative. Last month, a company called WebSense that sells filtering software to companies joined the GNI. WebSense has committed to making sure its software doesn't end up being used by governments that censor. For our part, those of us in government continue to work to turn our commitment to internet freedom into reality. And in 2011, the US and its international partners made a great deal of progress. First, last year, 34 nations of the OECD adopted a recommendation on internet policy-making principles. It includes strong language for the multi-stakeholder system of internet governance and for maintaining an open internet. The United States supports this approach, first, because it's working, and second, because it brings together the best of governments, the private sector, and civil society to manage the network. And it keeps in place, uh, that, has, that has kept the internet up and running for years all over the world. Second, 15 countries have now joined a group called the Coalition for Freedom Online, which was launched in The Hague last month. Secretary Clinton and I were there, 
and we were delighted to see that coalition countries endorsed a principled declaration and action plan. The coalition brings together governments, businesses, civil society, and academics to defend internet freedom. The countries will share information and coordinate diplomatic efforts around the world on a wide range of issues. They will stand up for the rights of netizens and cyber activists. And these governments will work with tech companies on ways to promote uh, respect for their customers' human rights and fundamental freedoms. Going forward, we believe that this coalition can advocate for a free and open platform for the next generation of users. These users will come mainly from the developing world, and they need to be part of the conversation. So we were pleased to see such a diverse group of companies step up to promote internet freedom from Ghana to Mongolia, Kenya to Mexico. I ask all of you to support and help grow the Coalition for Freedom Online as we will. Third, to put muscle behind our policy, Secretary Clinton also announced in The Hague the creation of a digital defenders partnership that will help cyber activists and netizens under threat. The United States and the Netherlands have committed funds to this initiative, and we hope others will as well. Fourth and finally, we continue to fund a broad range of advocacy, techno uh, technological responses, and training programs aimed at defending human rights online. The State Department and USAID have already spent over $70 million on projects ranging from developing better circumvention technologies and panic buttons for mobile phones to training uh, activists in cyber self-defense. Our slogan is old rights, new apps. Congress has been extremely supportive and directed us to continue these programs. My team in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor will keep combing the digital landscape for opportunities to invest in people and projects that will make a difference for embattled activists working in hard places. So I want to thank each of you for your commitment to the vision of a world where people can enjoy more freedom, online and off. Technology and history converged in 2011 to bring momentous change. In 2012, we have the precious opportunity to harness that change to build a more open, prosperous, and peaceful world. Thank you.